Hello and welcome to week five of our walk through the book of Exodus together. Uh, my name is Adam and I lead one of the venues of Everyday Church and it's a real privilege to be sharing with you today. Uh, we're about a month or so into our journey through the book of Exodus together and we've seen some wonderful truths already about who God is and what that means for me and you. Before we go any further, I'm just going to pause for a second and pray. just to invite you to join me in doing so. Lord, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations in my heart be pleasing to you today, God. I pray that what is shared over the next 25 minutes or so, would it be helpful? Would it be edifying? Would it point people to you, Jesus? And would it advance your kingdom and your glory on this earth? That's why I'm doing what I'm doing now, Lord. Amen. What I'd like to do over the next little while is just to zoom out a little bit. And we're focusing a lot uh, on this series through different aspects of the book of Exodus. But today we're going to be looking at Exodus 5 to 11. So we're going to zoom out quite a bit and focus more predominantly on one man's attitude instead of the series of events uh, as they are specific. It's important that we do that for two reasons. Because our attitudes and our responses reveal what's really going on in our hearts. And it's within the hearts of men and women that a battle takes place. Some of this is going to overlap with the events that we looked at in last week's talk, so I'd recommend watching that if you haven't watched it yet. It's a good one to catch up on. But just to give you some headlines to summarise, God has set aside for himself a people, a chosen people, through which he's going to speak to and meet with and to bless. And in Exodus, we find God has been blessing his people numerically, and they've grown from a fairly large but contained family to a very large and multiplying, fruitful people. Afraid that this people might get out of hand, the ruler of Egypt, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, has reacted negatively against God's people and has tried to subdue them. He's put very harsh labor conditions over them, really impossible working conditions and expectations. So we have this fruitful people set apart by God in conflict with a governing regime that is oppressive and unjust. And God has positioned a leader with a specific calling, a particular favor, to stand up against Pharaoh himself with the, com the commands and the conclusions of a holy God. Think, Great, so what? what? What on earth does that mean for me today here? I'm glad you're asking that. And to answer that, we're going to have a, a, pick, a pit stop on three questions and I believe that these are questions that are helpful and applicable whether you're a Christian today or whether you're just listening in from a place of curiosity maybe in even another position of faith first one is what does this reveal about Pharaoh what does this reveal about God and what does this really reveal about us so first of all what does this reveal about Pharaoh well Moses has encountered God in some really remarkable ways we read about it first of all in chapter 3, and he's given a confidence in who God is and an assurance that God is going to be with him as he negotiates with this Pharaoh. He's negotiating the release from captivity for a whole people group. But that's not so that they might storm the palace or start ransacking the town or anything like that, but so that they might have the freedom to go and worship God for themselves. Moses, along with his older brother Aaron, stand before Pharaoh and they boldly tell him, and this is Exodus 5, 1 to 2, they say, the Lord, the God of Israel, says, let my people go. Pharaoh re replies, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Now in case you're wondering, that's not a very wise or healthy response from Pharaoh, but God is not confused. He's, he's not um, he's not put off by Pharaoh's arrogance. God is not thrown into disarray by man's disbelief. To give you a little extra context, back then, if you were elevated to the position of a Pharaoh, you were esteemed with a, with a notion that you were somehow the son of the gods. Now, without a doubt, that kind of acclaim, that sense of entitlement, would have had a detrimental effect on somebody's pride and sense of position. It's hard to have a heart of humility when you think the world revolves around you. It's hard to have compassion 
when you think that everything exists purely to do your bidding. Imagine the most power-hungry politician for a moment, mixed with the most entitled member of the royal family, mixed with the wealthiest businessman, and then throw in a little bit of vain and, and uh, that kind of self-absorbed sense that you might find by, from a social media influencer. That's the kind of concoction of person that we've got when we have this pharaoh before us. Through Exodus, we meet a pharaoh who, who is a person who has such little regard for people, a leader who is in authority but is so blinded to the oppression and the injustice of an entire people group, one who doesn't perceive any value in people based on who they are, but uses them just to achieve his own purposes. So fixated on his own kingdom, keeping hold of his own influence, his own power at all costs, that he has lost sight of what it means to have a truer, greater sovereign over his life. Imagine a person consumed entirely by his own name, comfort, and control. Imagine a person that's convinced that everyone owes him adoration and yet is not going to show anything in return. Well, it's not that hard to imagine because if we take a quick look at our headlines for a moment, we see that kind of thing still happening. And if I'm being honest, if I take a quick scan of my own heart, not just the headlines out there, but the heart in here, reveals a man who easily gets frustrated when things don't go my own way. I can quickly assume that people owe me respect with very little effort, I can easily believe that the world revolves around me and my likes and my preferences. Do you know, when we get fixated on building our own little empires, we easily lose sight of the needs and the realities of those around us. When we get caught in the lie that life revolves around us and what the world owes us, we lose sight of the truth that there is a God who reigns above us, one who is deserving of our hearts, but one who also calls his people to stand up against injustices. There's a phrase that echoes throughout many chapters in the book of Exodus, from chapter 4 actually all the way through to chapter 14. It says, Pharaoh had a hard heart. It's referred to some 20 times actually. Having a hardened heart towards some, someone or something can mean different things for different people. But in the Bible, it refers to a state of spiritual insensitivity or resistance to, to God's love and his direction. Do you know, there are many reasons why somebody might have a hardened heart towards God. For example, it could be due to fear and insecurities. It could be difficult life experiences, sinful habits and patterns of behavior, lack of understanding or knowledge of God's nature and his teaching. Refusal to, refusal to acknowledge one's own faults or shortcomings. It pretty much always stems back to a lack of faith or a lack in trust of who God really is and what he really wants to establish in our lives. The theologian and, and the philosopher Dallas Willard writes, the greatest need that you and I have, the greatest need of humanity in general, is renovation of our hearts. The spiritual place within us from which outlook, choices and actions come from is being formed by a world denying God. It must be transformed. Indeed, the only hope for humanity lies in the fact that just as our spirit has been formed, so it can also be transformed. I wonder in what way might your heart be hardened to God today? For me personally, I know that if God doesn't answer my prayers in a particular way that I was hoping for, something of a turmoil starts happening in here. More often than not, if there's an area of my life that I want to retain some kind of control over, I mean, especially as a parent to three children, that's, that's an area where I, I kind of want to keep my hands on to, to certain things more than I maybe should. You know, Pharaoh loves control and has become reliant on an entire people group being enslaved by his very commands. He says, these are my people. They do what I say. They revere my authority. Moses comes to him and says, no, no, they're God's people. He's calling them out to come and worship him. Pharaoh's heart says, no, I, I want them enslaved. I want them oppressed. No, God says, I've called them to freedom. I've called them to fullness of life. 
Moses represents the kingdom of light. Pharaoh represents the kingdom of darkness. Do you know there is a God who wants, who yearns for your freedom in all areas of life? Do you know that there is an enemy, the devil, who wants to keep us captive, who, to subdue us, to keep us without hope? Between Moses, who is who's God's mouthpiece in this moment, and Pharaoh, we see this back and forth between the God who is slow to anger and, and merciful, committed to freedom for, from all oppression and all captivity, and a leader who is stubborn. A man who is unrepentant, lacking any sense of humility. So it's helpful, I think, to ask, does God allow Pharaoh's heart to become hardened? Or does Pharaoh's choices result in his heart becoming stubborn and refusing of God? I think the answer is yes. Both take place. In the ten chapters of Exodus, we find ten times that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And we find ten times that Pharaoh chooses to become hardened by his reactions. Chapter 7, verse 3, God says to Moses, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. But in chapter 8, verse 15, it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart and would not listen. Why? How was both of those things happening at the same time? Well, if I personalize this for a moment, I can think of some people in my own life who I've known, and I've gone out of my way to be nice to them to be kind to them, to be gracious towards them. And they have just not been able to accept it. They haven't known how to handle that kind of tone or behavior, perhaps. It's almost like the more gracious, the more compassionate you are towards them, the more resistant and closed off they become to that behavior. Now, I am fully aware that I am not God. I am well aware of that. But if that can happen on a human level, How much more might that be uh, possible between creator and created? Between chapters 5 and 11 of Exodus, God says to Pharaoh repeatedly, I'm giving you a chance. Let the people go. Pharaoh's response is, no, I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm going to challenge everything about your existence. I'm going to push back. God's reply is, I'm going to give you another chance and another chance and another and another. And in doing so, God's grace shines a light on this man's sin. God's grace is always undeserved. But here we see an example of when it is often unwelcomed too. Do you know, sometimes we can be so trapped in our own sense of self-importance, in our own framework of seeing the world around us, hindered by our own limits of experience, that the grace and mercy of this almighty, all-knowing, all loving God is actually repellent to some. It's so easy to be used to functioning in dysfunction, dysfunctional sinful patterns of living, that that becomes the only framework that life can be observed through. Do you know, God owes us no warnings. He owes us no favours. He owes us no proof of evidence at all. And yet sometimes if we catch a glimpse of him, we reject it. We recoil, we refuse him. Yet in Romans 1, it tells us that God makes himself known. How wonderful that he'd even choose to do that. The Apostle Paul says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Like Pharaoh, we can easily worship the life that we think that we're creating for ourselves when in reality God invites us to worship him as the one who created it. Paul goes on to say about people who resist or or dismiss God. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but in their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans 1 wraps up even by saying, that God, therefore, is going to give some people over to sinful choices and shameful lusts and depraved minds. Wow. Spurgeon once said, and I think he was quoting an old Puritan saying when he said it, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay, 
And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. Do you know, it's the, in the nature of God the Father to say, I love you. I'm patient with you. I'm available to you. But if you dismiss me, if I'm going to allow your godless living to continue a little while longer and you'll be judged by it. Unbelief does not derail God's plans or hinder his display of glory on this earth. He is glorious because he is sovereign. Not because we choose to acknowledge him or not. That doesn't move the dial of his sovereignty, sovereignty one little bit. So what if in his sovereignty, God sometimes allows the foolish posture to remain solely for the purpose of revealing two greater things. The first thing, his absolute promise to a chosen people and his absolute commitment to a holy judgment. He cares about both those things greatly. If we were all robots who just fell into line with what he said and did his being without any freedom to choose, reject, welcome, refuse, that wouldn't be a healthy basis for a relationship, would it? So what does this reveal about God? Well, to help me answer that, let let me just use a, a quick illustration. Imagine there was this incredibly kind father. His tone was gentle. His temperament was patient. He brought provision in for his family. He was providing protection for them. All who observed his ways knew that he was a great dad. They could see that very clearly. And he went off to work each day. And each day he dealt with some incredibly horrible situations. Watertight evidence was brought before him of murder and rape and abuse and fraud and deception and dishonesty and all kinds of horrible things. Sinful choice after sinful choice. Because that great dad, that loving father, was also a judge in a courtroom. And he had judgments that he was able to hand out based on evidence that was given to him. And he was fair. He was discerning. He prioritized truth and he had an impeccable, impeccable record. Was that man a loving father? Yes. Was that man a fair judge? Yes. Was he able to do both things and be both things simultaneously? Yes. If that might be true on a human level, how much more could that or should that be true of God himself? Now later in Exodus in chapter 34, it says the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. That's echoed in Psalm 86 and again in Jonah chapter 4 as well. If someone was holding on to my children, enslaving them, abusing them, stripping them of their freedom in life, I would not ask their captors ten times to release them. I would lose the plot. I would be out of control. But God is a patient father, And he's a fair judge. There is a heaven with him. And there is a hell without him. But he is sovereign over everything and everyone. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, a letter to the church. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. This is who God is, patient, compassionate, merciful, gracious. If you're not living with him, if you're not living for him today, you need to know he pursues you with the desire to love you, to forgive you, to heal you, to restore you. Yet, he's committed to judgment for sin, committed to justice for those who are oppressed. Sovereign over all creation, yes. And more fatherly in his desires and his affections we could possibly ever fathom. If, as the created, we want all things to be put right, which many of us will do, doesn't God, the creator, have 
that same right as well. Just how faithful is God to his promise and of grace and his promise of justice? Well, we see just how much through this astonishing and completed work of the cross where the love of God and the commitment of, for, towards justice collide. Chapters 5 to 11 in, in Exodus reveal just how committed God is to rescuing and restoring his chosen people, the Israelites. And yet the life the death, the resurrection of God's son, Jesus, reveals just how committed he is to making that invitation available to all people, not just a chosen few, but all nations, all people groups, all ethnicities, irrespective of our history, irrespective of the condition of our hearts. Friends, we are not the Lord of our lives. We're not innately good people. We're not naturally deserving of blessing or favour or forgiveness. So in my own strength, I can be really unholy and I'm very deserving of God's judgment. Now we are all the problem. We are all in need of a solution. And guess what? The solution is Jesus, the king of hearts, the only one capable and willing to do the heart surgery that we all need. He's gathering for himself a people whose hearts have been won and who are being softened, humbled, healed, made whole. Who are repentant, receptive to his offer of forgiveness. A forgiveness that only comes through trusting in him, the perfect one. The only one qualified to soften a hardened heart. Isaiah 42 describes him as the one whose faithfulness brings forth justice on earth. The one in whom the nations put their hope. Now the Bible also says in 1 Peter 2 that this sinless Jesus was punished and faced up to the worst kind of judgment in my place, in your place. It says he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. What does that really reveal to us about us? Well, God is not obligated to forgive or save anybody. He chooses to. He willingly did it. And if he didn't choose some, there would be no hope whatsoever. There'd be no healing for anyone. But because of Jesus, there is. Friends, he owes us nothing. Yet he makes the wonders and the truth of his kingdom available to those who repent and earnestly seek him. The Bible is full from start to finish of men and women who don't deserve blessing. And yet God graciously pours it out. That finds its pinnacle in this one specific moment in history, the cross of Christ where the sin of man and the disregard for God are punished for once and for all. All roads lead to the seat, judgment seat of Christ. Every road leads to that judgment seat that he sat on. There's a sinful people who get grace and there's a sinful people who get justice. That's who God is working with. That's who he's always worked with. Now, I don't know how you view God as I'm saying these things. These are big truths to, to be grappling with. And I'm aware that this message is going to be viewed by people all across many different nations living in a very vast variety of different circumstances. But I want to say to each and every one of you, if you see God as cruel and unfair and reactive, that's a God you're going to run and hide from. That's a God you won't want to surrender your heart to, and I wouldn't blame you. But when we view God's love and his forgiveness through the judgment of Christ, 
the sacrifice and resurrection of Christ, the invitation of Christ, that's the God that you want to run to. I wonder, are you one of his people? Are you one of his people? As I've been reflecting on Moses and his interactions with Pharaoh through chapters 5 to 11 in Exodus, a few things have confronted my heart. Pharaoh hates to be challenged or hand over control. I can see some of that in me. I'm going to assume that you might have some of that too. Pharaoh is stuck in his way of doing things. That's, that's easy for a lot of us to do. Pharaoh puts himself first and disregards the struggles of the, the oppressed and the hurting around him. We can't be doing that as well. Pharaoh's default is to be unrepentant, unyielding, unaware of what God is saying and doing. That might be true for many of us hearing this today. Our default is to think, God, you owe me. I deserve blessing. God shows great patience, wonderful mercy in showing his judgment, and a judgment occurs. And now, whether you receive or reject the judgment that was laid upon Jesus, that's the most significant thing that you can ever do. Nothing more significant. By the judgment of one, Pharaoh, a whole people were condemned, and we see it through chapters 5 to 11 in Exodus, but by the judgment of one, Jesus, People from all nations can receive salvation and freedom today. Do you know, we will all stand before this sovereign, holy God one day. Will you stand before him with a hardened, unrepentant, unrelenting heart or with one that has been softened, won by, healed by Jesus? Is yours a heart that is surrendered to him? I want to urge you as you're listening to this now. Consider the freedom that is yours if you are his. And walk in the good of it. Consider the implications if you are not yet his. What are you waiting for? Give your heart to him today. God bless you.